Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the state. Uh, today, I'm happy to welcome John Taylor, who um, works at this uh, Margaret Chase Smith Library and Museum, and he's also the uh, Maine National History Day State Coordinator as well. Um, <coughs> and I have done a um, good amount of work together. I've been able to judge National History Day. Uh, John has brought me into the Margaret Chase Smith Library along with David Richards, who I see is here as well, um, who runs Margaret Chase Smith Library. It's a fantastic um, place to stop in and learn about some Maine history. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, the Margaret Chase Smith Library Museum for hosting me and the United States Senate Youth Program. So let's get those formal thank yous on the record since we have both John and David I'm here this morning. So I'm gonna go ahead then and turn it over to John Taylor and he's gonna tell us about Senator Margaret Chase Smith and her 1964 presidential run. Uh, thank you, Joe. And thank you everybody for attending today. This is a little strange. I, this is actually my first time to actually uh, do a presentation via Zoom. So uh, please bear with me as I try to uh, go through this a little bit. But uh, yeah, uh, Joe reached out to me and asked me to uh, s uh, discuss either National History Day or Senator Margaret Chase Smith, and I uh, chose to uh, kind of combine the both of them a little bit, I suppose, but uh, we are going to talk about the Margaret Chase Smith, and I thought it would be interesting to kind of look at it from the lens of her presidential run in 1964 and uh, how gender uh, was portrayed throughout her presidential run. Um, so uh, I've titled the, the program today here, I Decided That I Shall, and as we get through the, the, the presentation here, you'll understand why I uh, chose that quote. Uh, but um, just a little bit of background first about the Margaret Chase Smith Library before we get into it. Uh, I do want to say that uh, we are an, a congressional library. Uh, of course, we are not uh, a lending library. Uh, we do house over 300,000 documents from Margaret's time in uh, Washington. And uh, it is uh, typically open to the public, but we do have our collection specialist, Angie Stockwell, is still working with the public and getting information out digitally to people. So if you are wanting to do research at this time, you still can, uh, but obviously uh, uh, with everything going on and closures uh, and the University of Maine still having us closed down, uh, it is not, we're not allowing people into the building. Uh, but when we do, we do have a museum uh, that is dedicated to her life as well. And uh, we also, have her home, which the library and the museum are built onto. And so it's a very unique thing that we have here in Maine that we have a senator uh, who is, uh, whose library is also connected to the home and has a museum. It's much more like a presidential library than, uh, than you would expect for a senator. So it's a very cool thing that we have here and it's up in Skowhegan, Maine. And I uh, would encourage everybody to come out and see us, uh, especially once uh, restrictions are starting to be lifted. Uh, as of right now, though, we are currently working on some lesson plans that we would like to uh, be able to provide for teachers in the fall in case uh, we do do some more virtual learning. Uh, and we are currently working on some field trips as well uh, that we can, are going to be doing virtually. So we'll still be able to do scavenger hunts with uh, our grade school students and we'll still be able to work with our middle school and high school students uh, with some of our archives. Uh, primary sources in our archives and things like that. So please uh, follow us at mcslibrary.org. Uh, that is our website. We'll be posting a lot of that stuff soon. We also have a couple of digital exhibits that are coming up. Uh, every year we do a, a rotating exhibit and we're turning all those digital right now and those will be coming up onto our website probably in about a week, week and a half actually. Uh, and hopefully uh, you will be able to use those with your students as well uh, in the fall. Uh, so. Uh, as Joe was saying, I am a museum assistant there at the library, uh, which means that I do uh, kind of a jack of all trades thing. I do a lot of uh, independent research and do create a lot of exhibits there. But I am also the uh, state coordinator for National History Day in Maine. And for anybody who's not familiar with National History Day, it is a program that encourages middle and high school age students to do independent research based on a theme every year. And this year's theme was actually breaking barriers in history, which is a very, very fun an interesting theme uh, and we saw a lot of different um, uh, projects uh, and unique projects this year because of that theme. Uh, but we encourage students to do uh, their own independent historical research and then uh, they do present it to professionals in the field and it is a contest tiered system. So it starts at the school level, goes to a regional level, uh, which we have three regions here in the state 
uh, and then uh, uh, a state contest, typically at uh, the University of Maine in Orono. And then uh, the winners there are invited down to the national contest in Maryland in College Park. And so, uh, sorry, something popped up on my screen there. Uh, and, uh, you know, this year we did have um, some, uh, obviously we had to do a virtual this year. And so uh, we were lucky enough to have one regional contest down in Lewiston that, that uh, was in person, but everything else uh, was virtual and we were happy that we were able to still provide that for students and teachers. So um, with further ado, we will move on to um, the life and legacy of Margaret Chase Smith. So before I get into her actual just running for president, I, I wanna do a little bit of an overview of her life. And so, um, she was born in 1897 in Skowhegan, Maine. Um, she graduated in, from Skowhegan uh, High School in 1916. Uh, she was actually the captain of her basketball team at that time. She loved playing basketball. Basketball back then for, for women uh, was a little bit different than what it is today uh, and, you, and what you would expect. But um, at that time when she graduated, she actually wanted to become a phys ed teacher and she could not afford to go down to Boston to go to college. Uh, and so she was never able to um, get a college education. But if you go into our library, you'll see uh, 90, uh, let's see, 95 hoods, honorary degrees or hoods hanging up in, in the museum uh, from all the honorary degrees that she received throughout her career. Um, in 1922, she then began organizing the Business and Professional Women's Group in Skowhegan. She became the founder there in, in Skowhegan and then later became the president of it throughout the, for the state. Uh, and uh, this was a group that uh, was advocating for um, uh, looking out for women's rights uh, and, and uh, in the workplace, and especially for women who were unmarried at that time, women um, who were waiting a little bit longer to, to, for marriage and they would um, still be out in the workforce for quite a, quite a bit longer. And uh, this was a way to uh, ensure that um, they were um, being represented uh, in different parts of the states. Uh, her work with the BPW actually gave her a lot of political connections and uh, she actually ended up marrying Clyde Smith in 1930. Now they actually met in 1914 when Clyde Smith actually um, uh, hired her to do some, uh, work with some of the books that when he was a town selectman there in Skowhegan. Uh, and what's interesting is Clyde Smith's career in life is a very interesting one as well. And uh, it's, it's interesting that hers overshadows his, because this is a man who uh, uh, was from Heartland, Maine. Uh, he was a business owner. He had many different uh, businesses that he owned in the area. He owned the theater. He owned a potato starch factory company, he owned a shoe company. Um, but he was also ran in 48 different elections and never lost one as well. And so uh, it, it was anywhere from a sheriff all the way up to the U.S. House of Representatives that he, he worked. But his goal was to be governor of the state. And um, that never happened. Uh, but, and he was 21 years older than Margaret as well when they married in 1930. And it was a kind of a marriage of convenience as well. She was uh, 33 at the time. And uh, he was a divorced man who, uh, who needed who wanted a wife uh, as a way uh, to um, also get into the governorship as well. But in 1930, when uh, after they were married and he decided he was going to run for governor, uh, he actually then ended up running later for the U.S. House of Representatives in 1936 because the Republican Party here in the state asked him to do that instead. And so that's what he did. Uh, he died in 1940, 10 years after they, after they were married. Uh, and she actually took over his seat in the House of U.S. Representatives. He was he was there at the time. Uh, and she then ran in four successful elections there at the House of Representatives. Uh, and so she had four terms in the House. And then uh, while she was in the House, it was very interesting that in 1947, two years after World War II, she was able to get legislation passed that gave uh, uh, women uh, permanent status in the military as well. Before that time, uh, they were only temporary status. And she thought, well, if they were needed so badly, then they should also be treated fairly and give uh, 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 full status there in the military. Uh, in 1948, she decided that she was going to run for the Senate because the Senate seat opened up here in the, in the state of Maine. Uh, and 
nobody thought that she had a chance to win in the, in the Republican primary at that time. She was actually running against a sitting governor and a former governor. And um, if you know anything about Maine political history, at that time, Maine was a very Republican state. So if you won the primary, you were pretty much guaranteed to win the, the general election in November. And she did pull that off. She won it. She won the primary in 1948 and then did win, obviously, get elected in, 19, in November 1948 and was then sworn in in January 3rd, 1949. Um, her most famous speech and her most famous act that she did in the Senate uh, was, of course, giving her Declaration of Conscience speech in 1950. Uh, during that speech, uh, it was definitely aimed at the tactics used by Senator, Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy. Um, and his, his tactics in the, in the witch hunts and the Red Scare at that time. Uh, she never said his name in the speech, but everybody knew what she was talking about. Uh, and that, right after that speech, that's when uh, some talk about possible presidential runs began uh, to, to uh, kind of trickle in and, and kind of be spoken about a little bit. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we get through more of this. Uh, but she did run for the presidency in 1964. Uh, and then uh, she did lose re-election in 1972. Uh, she uh, lost to Bill Hathaway that year, and Bill Hathaway became a one-term senator after that. And interestingly enough, um, our current senator, Angus King, actually was on Bill Hathaway's uh, campaign committee at that time uh, and was actually running, helping Bill Hathaway run against Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, and then um, about, well, roughly 10 years later, uh, the library that uh, I work at was then, was then dedicated. And it was actually uh, her, the suggestion of her executive assistant, Bill Lewis, who we'll talk about a little bit as well as we go through this, was the one who uh, convinced her to build this library. Because at that time, and still today, senators usually give their papers to their alma mater. Uh, and since Margaret never did have the opportunity to go to college, uh, they wanted to figure out a way that they could uh, have her papers archived and still be available to the public. Uh, in 1989, she was then given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor a civilian can get uh, by President George H.W. Bush at the time. And then she passed away on Memorial Day in 1995. Uh, and it's hard to believe, actually, that it's actually been 25 years since Margaret passed away, especially since if you work in the archives or you go into the archives and you dig around, it's amazing how many different connections uh, she still has with um, different things going on in the world today. Uh, and uh, we'll, of course, talk about that a little bit. So 1964. 1964 is when uh, Margaret ran for the presidency. And 1964 is a pivotal year. And uh, I just wanted to list off a few things that happened and that were pivotal in American history at that time, or even world history at that time. Of course, um, President Kennedy was assassinated uh, two months before 1964. Um, but you, that year, you did have the Freedom Summer. Uh, so the, the rise of the civil, uh, civil rights movement was happening there. Uh, you had a lot of college-age students going down to the South and uh, starting to register African-American voters down there. And, and um, that's when you did have uh, the, the famous um, um, well, you, you, it's when you had the, the three college students who were, were murdered down there as well, uh, which affected a lot of people and made headlines all across the nation and the world. Uh, you did also have the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that President Lyndon Johnson signed. Uh, it was also the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which uh, gave the president much more power to uh, uh, escalate the war at that time, uh, even though we do know now that uh, uh, the ships were probably not fired upon there in the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, as, as the administration, uh, Johnson administration claimed. You also had the British invasion. So uh, you'll notice as we go through this that I am a pop culture nerd. And so we will be talking a little bit about pop culture as well. Uh, but yes, the British invasion happened, of course, with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones coming into popularity at that time. And two Bond movies, two James Bond movies came out that year. And uh, that would be From Russia With Love and Goldfinger. Uh, now, I am being a little facetious and a little coy about uh, you know, mentioning the James Bond movies, but I also want to point out that, uh, keep in mind how misogynistic those movies were. So it actually kind of fits into what I'm talking about, especially in the 1960s. Those books and those movies were very misogynistic. And so uh, keep that in mind as we uh, talk about this, and we talk about um, how 
Margaret's gender was portrayed in the media. Uh, and then of course, Senator Margaret J. Smith ran for the, for the White House. So interestingly enough, I'm going to start this talk really uh, with something that I usually end my house tours with. And that is because as we go through Margaret's house, when I give a tour out there, especially when I'm speaking with students, uh, when I take middle school and high school age students through there and they are gonna get ready to start going through our archives and digging through our material, I especially love to use this, um, this primary source example to talk to them about um, you know, dissecting a, a, a source. And so, um, as we go through the kitchen, I always stop them and I tell them about this uh, kitchen, her kitchen being mentioned in the Ladies Home Journal in November 1956. Now you have to think about this as we, as I just talked about her uh, biography uh, and I gave you kind of a rundown of, of her life and career. In 1956, she's already been in Congress for 16 years. Uh, she has uh, given women um, permanent status in the military or help give women permanent status in the military. Uh, she spoke against McCarthy on the Senate floor six years prior to. She's on the Armed Services Committee at this time. And pretty soon she's actually going to be in the Space and Aeronautics and Sciences Committee as well. And so she's a pretty powerful politician. And I always like to point out, though, that in this source, if you are able to read it and you look at it, all they talk about is her kitchen. And so that is something I always ask students about what they think about or what that means and what was, what was the mentality in 1956. And of course, stu students will kind of have to dance around it a little bit, but it is, it's a gender stereotype. Uh, and it's, it's interestingly, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that the Ladies Home Journal obviously did not think that women were, would be interested in, in reading or learning about Margaret's political side. Uh, and uh, I always use this as an example that as students go into our archives, I always ask them, what do they, what do they think they are going to be seeing that day in the archive? And most of them will say it's, they're, they're going to be reading a bunch of letters and correspondence. And yes, most of our archive is letters and correspondence. It's letters and correspondence between Margaret and uh, people she worked with. And, but more importantly, people that were her constituents that she represented in the state of Maine. And so that is interesting and you will read a lot of letters and you'll see that stuff, but I tell them to take in what these uh, types of sources will do as well. Because if you put them into context and you're looking at them and you realize that this is a very powerful politician and it, she's been in Congress for 16 years and they're only talking about her kitchen, not only do you need to look at what's in the source, but what's not in the source or the artifact. And that is gonna tell you a lot as well. And that's what I try to hammer home sometimes when I, when I speak with students when they're looking at their project or looking at their sources that they're, for their projects. Um, so, <clears throat> beginning with her presidential speculation, actually it began long before she, she ran in 1964. In 1952, she actually ended up um, on the cover, uh, there was, well, there was rumors about her being a possible presidential nominee for then General Eisenhower. Uh, and uh, we all know that uh, uh, Richard Nixon ended up becoming the vice president then, and we all know what happened to him. But um, right after her declaration of conscience speech, there was rumors about her being uh, eligible or, or being uh, a viable candidate to run for, for the presidency and the vice presidency. And so there were rumors that she was on the cover of Newsweek uh, and that was being mentioned that she could be a possible vice presidential nominee even in the 1950s. Uh, but for the actual presidential run in 1964, we have to look start at August 1963. Uh, as I was doing research on her run, uh, it's there, the rumors begin to circulate that she's she might be uh, running for the presidency in August of 1963. She's kind of kept quiet about it at this time, and uh, she's really. Um, not being very uh, open about what she's thinking about doing, but uh, the, the first article I can find about the speculation would be August of 1963. Uh, and of course, when she's trying to decide if she's going to run in August of 1963, um, she of course thinks if she wins the, president, uh, the, the nomination, the Republican nomination, she's gonna have to run against President Kennedy, of course. Uh, and so, she started um, 
creating this, this pamphlet that never ended up going out. And um, this is a pamphlet called The Kennedy Twist. And I mentioned I'm a pop culture nerd. Does anybody know what this is a reference to in pop culture? Don't be shy. Joe? I'll jump in, John, since nobody's sure. in that room we're on. Is this in reference to uh, Chubby Checkers, The Twist? It would be, yes. She actually chose this because that was the popular song at that time. She actually decided to use the word twist uh, in this pamphlet. Now, this pamphlet never did go out to the public at all, uh, but we do have them in our archive now. But the idea that she actually created this with a pop culture mentality there is kind of interesting. But uh, the actual pamphlet is an interesting pamphlet because what she did is she decided to take what President Kennedy had said as a presidential candidate and what he had done as president to show that, uh, for lack of a better term, flip-flopping or, uh, you know, he, he, he wasn't living up to the promises that he said as a candidate. And so, for example, uh, the missile gap is one of them that she talks about in this, in this pamphlet. In the missile gap, of course, as he was running for the presidency, he said there's a huge gap uh, in, in, the, in the missile gap uh, between Russia and the United States. And Russia had way more than the United States did and we needed to catch up with them. And of course, once he became president, he, uh, he, he backed down on that rhetoric. And, and uh, you know, as we all know, it, 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 we, we had many more than, than Russia at that time. Uh, and so that's just one example of that Kennedy twist there that, that she would put in there. Um, but she also felt one of the reasons that she wanted to run was because she thought she was the more moderate alternative for the, for the uh, Republican voters. Uh, the the two, top two people uh, that were most likely going to win the nomination that year was Senator Barry Goldwater, who was very conservative, uh, and then no, uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller from New York, who uh, uh, people consider much more liberal, a much more liberal uh, Republican. She thought she pretty much uh, was in between those two, and uh, she thought that she might be a good alternative instead of those, those two candidates uh, as they began to run for the presidency. Now, with that rumor circulating and everything, just a few weeks before President Kennedy um, was assassinated, he was actually asked what he thought about uh, if Senator Smith ran. And he did say uh, he would not look forward to campaigning against Margaret Chase Smith and called her a formidable political figure, uh, which I think is, is a, a very nice sentiment. Uh, and of course, he had just uh, been with uh, or met with Margaret Chase Smith just a few weeks prior to this comment because he was here in Maine actually getting an honorary degree from the University of Maine. And she actually flew uh, back uh, to Washington with him on Air Force One at that time. But as this, as this started circulating, as, as the rumors were circulating, she started to receive mail that was urging her to run. And I have, have gone through every piece of, of correspondence that is connected to her uh, presidential run. And it's very interesting to see all of the, um, all of the responses that she received uh, either to, uh, prior to her announcement or after her announcement. Now, when she actually stood on the floor and gave her declaration of conscience speech, she received a lot of nasty letters. And she, but she also received a lot of letters in support of what she had said, and, uh, said there on the Senate floor. And so I, I, as I was, uh, so she kept up both, all, all of the responses, of course. And we do have some of them in our, in our museum and, and that you can see. And then of course, you can see all of them in our archive. But as I started to do research, I was expecting to see a bunch of letters uh, of people saying, uh, you know, that women can't be president. Uh, they were against what she was uh, doing here, everything like that. Every letter that I read was in support of her actually running for the presidency, which was very interesting. And I, I was very surprised by that, um, which again is something that I always talk about with students. Don't make assumptions and just think that that assumption is gonna be correct. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later here too. But, um, I, I was shocked actually by that. And, and as I thought about it, she clearly didn't get rid of the letters that were, were nasty to her when, in 1950 when she gave her speech. And so I, there's no reason to believe that she would have gotten rid of the letters saying that she shouldn't be president or she shouldn't run for president because she was a female. So I was, I was very surprised by that, uh, but also uh, very happy to see that as well. So her, she had actually planned um, 
a press conference on December 1963 to actually announce her decision at that time. Now, of course, we know um, that uh, just a, a, a few weeks earlier, on November 22nd, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. And so she decided to push that date back uh, to January uh, in, res in, in respect to the president. Uh, but as the mail started coming in and uh, to her, uh, she started getting a lot of letters. And not only was it from uh, adults, but it was also from s kids. And uh, this letter here, I'm not sure if you can really read it, but uh, it's from a 10 year old lady uh, from, uh, who wrote to Margaret and said, I have always hoped that you would run for president. I have always believed that someday a woman will be president. I think you are that woman. This is coming from a 10 year old young lady here. Uh, and then if you can read down there at the bottom, the little square that is kind of paper clipped there, uh, that is something that says, this is my own money that I have saved for you. So she was actually contributing to her campaign as well. Uh, and what's interesting with uh, a lot of this is she did not take any campaign contributions. She actually sent, because there are a lot of letters like this, and it's very interesting, the money that, that was sent to her was never like large bills. So it would always be just a few dollars or maybe even a few cents that were uh, sent to her, but she would always send that money back. She never accepted campaign contributions. Um, so, and, and uh, let's see, and, and that's because she wanted to run on her record uh, and she didn't want to have, have to answer to anybody as well. So going back to public reaction and speculation, before uh, she makes her announcement, uh, the Portland, uh, let's see, what is it? It's the Portland Evening, Evening Express. Uh, decides to go out and do a man on the street type of interview. And this is one of my favorite um, uh, primary sources that I like to show students here. As you can see, there's a wide range of, of, of ages here and you do have men and women being represented in this. And it's just one of those things where they went out and they wanted to ask, could a woman candidate be for president or for vice president? And I love to show this one to students and I love to have them guess a little bit. And so, what I typically do is I will pick out this gentleman here and I will ask them what they think this gentleman would say to the, to the question, can a woman be president? Uh, does anybody want to guess what the students would, would say? Well, of course, in 1964, they would be guessing that uh, this gentleman would absolutely in no way be thinking that a woman would be a viable candidate for the presidency and, and should be in the Oval Office. <clears throat> this is his response. Until Senator Smith's news, I don't believe the question ever came up. I'm undecided whether I'd vote for a woman for president and the same holds for a woman for vice president. So he's not necessarily for it, but he's not necessarily against it either, which I think is a very interesting sentiment coming from a gentleman of that age who's probably, uh, I would guess, in his 70s at that time. So then I always move on to this gentleman here that's in that man on the street. And I ask the students who they think, would, what this gentleman would think. Now he's a little bit younger. I would get, probably guess maybe late 40s, early 50s maybe. Um, and his reaction is never. And that goes for both a woman president and a male presidential nominee with a woman for his running mate. Women are unsuited to the responsibilities of the presidency and it's a man's job. So um, sometimes the students will guess, well, maybe he would be a little like on the fence and maybe, he, and maybe he, his reaction would be a lot more like the, the older gentleman here. Uh, but uh, you can obviously see he's, he's staunchly against it. Uh, and then uh, the other one I always like to point out is this young lady here who I'm guessing is maybe 19, maybe in her early 20s. And of course the students will then think that obviously she's a young woman. She definitely will think that a, a woman is a viable candidate for the presidency or vice presidency. And her answer is definitely no vote for me. Emotions are what guide women, not sense. I wouldn't vote for a woman for vice president either. She might become president. So again, it's one of these things where I always tell students, don't make the assumptions based on, on what you know now or what you might think you might know about then as well. You need to read and look at the context of the sources. And all three of these uh, examples are, are people that you would 
expect to have a different answer than what they have. And uh, it, it's very fascinating to see that. And I, and I found it very interesting to see, actually, as, as I did research on, on this, uh, on Margaret's presidential run, uh, women's reactions to it. it. It was very, very mixed. But uh, her announcement came in January 27th, 1964 at the Women's National Press Club. Now note that she's speaking at the Women's National Press Club. Uh, that at that time was still divided by gender, uh, the press clubs were. <clears throat> uh, and so she teased her audience a little bit as she was giving her speech. Nobody knew what she was going to say. Nobody knew if she was actually going to run for the presidency or not. And she actually, they knew they were gonna, she was gonna talk about the presidency, but she was going to actually make uh, an announcement whether she was or was not running because the rumors were circling around so much. And so she teased her audience and proclaimed that she had neither the money, like I said, she would always give the money back, uh, any campaign contributions, nor the organization to make a successful run. That, that's right. She never created like an actual campaign office uh, that actually ran a, a presidential campaign. Uh, and so for the majority, of, but she started listing off a majority of reasons of why people told her she should not run. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's six or seven reasons that she named off. One of them was obviously because she didn't have an organization, she didn't have money, but the rest of them were all gender-based. And it all had to do with her being a woman. Uh, and this including being told that no woman should aspire to be a president. And so the, after listing off all of these reasons of why uh, people told her not to run, this is what she said. Let's see if uh, this works. Of these very compelling reasons against my running, I have decided that I shall. Now, hopefully that everybody was able to see that video and it did work uh, there. But uh, I, I love the reaction of Margaret after she says that. And of course, now you know why I titled this presentation, I decided that I shall. Um, but I, I love the, 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 the smirk on her face after she, after she makes that line uh, saying that she is uh, a female political leader and she is uh, a, a viable candidate for the presidency and, and she's going to do it. Now here's another view of that announcement at, right after she gives it. Uh, let's see here. And this is actually one of my favorite photos in the entire archive uh, that, at the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And I actually even have it as my background on my computer uh, and it's hanging up in my office. Uh, this is, I, I love the reactions here on, the, on this picture. Uh, way back in the corner, you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but way back here in the back, this is her executive assistant, Bill Lewis. This is the gentleman who she had been working with since the late forties. He was the one that convinced her to run for the Senate in the first place when that seat opened up. He was the one that convinced her that she should run for the presidency in 1964. He was also the one that convinced her to build the library in Skowhegan, Maine now. Um, he was a very important figure in her life and in, in her career. And I, I love seeing how proud he is of that moment of her announcing her run for the presidency. I also love seeing these women who work in the press up front. And I love seeing the smiles and the reactions on her faces as they, are, as they realize what she had just said, that she is going to be running for the presidency and that they know that she's actually a viable candidate to run for that office. So... <clears throat> immediately uh, there was talk obviously that uh, how she was going to run her campaign uh, and so it started with the primaries and she put on a bunch of self-imposed limitations on her uh, on this campaign uh, and she thought it was very important for that reason now she did have no national organization um, or uh, or a or affiliate that was actually kind of running everything nationally for her. Uh, she actually only ran in three uh, uh, three primaries. Uh, that would of course be in New Hampshire, um, and then on Illinois and Oregon, she was on the ballot as well. Uh, and so she didn't have a large war chest. Like I said, she never took any campaign contributions. She didn't have a lot of money to spend on this, and she did not want to expend, uh, spend a lot of time on the campaign trail. She, it was very important to her 
that um, she uh, would re remain in Congress in, in doing her official, her official duties. She refused to leave those official duties and she never wanted to miss a roll call vote. So anytime that she was out on the road and she, there was a roll call vote, she would come back and make sure that she had voted for that. So um, <clears throat> if this was, these are all limitations that if you know or you watch a president's uh, campaign now, th these are all limitations that are really gonna hurt and affect you. Uh, as you were trying to run for the, the office of the presidency. But she wanted to run on her record alone. She believed, as others did as well, that um, she was the most experienced candidate. She had the most time in, in Congress compared to all the others that were running on the Republican side. Uh, and she uh, had the most experience. Uh, so, and she, it's not like she wasn't on uh, in, uh, important um, subcommittees and things like that. And so she wanted to run solely on her record of what she had done in Congress as uh, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. And I think that was her trying to prove a point that this is what the presidential campaign should be about, not necessarily how much money uh, and how many commercials and how much support you can get behind you because of that. Uh, so immediately, uh, some of these type of gender ideas started rolling into um, <clears throat> the media and pop culture uh, connected to her running for the presidency. Uh, one of the more interesting things to look at, especially during um, uh, her presidential run are all the political cartoons and to see some of the gender stereotypes that are, are shown or are being portrayed a little bit here in the cartoons. And uh, this is just one, but we'll show some others here. I'll show some others here in a little bit. Um, but again, they, they decided that she's thrown her hat into the ring to run for the presidency. And so you have a, a, a political cartoon that's up here uh, showing a woman's hat here and then all these different other men's hats being thrown into a ring. Now I'm not necessarily sure, necessarily sure off the top of my head uh, what all the hats represent or who all the hats represent, but I do know the top hat here with the money, uh, dollar bill signs areas for Nelson Rockefeller. And if I believe the Stetson hat here would be for Barry Goldwater. Um, but you can see there's pictures of her throwing a hat through a ring uh, that were in the newspaper. Uh, it's mentioned here in uh, the LBJ cartoon as well, tossing bonnet into presidential ring. And then this woman over here on the left is actually a, a hat maker from Illinois who was th so thrilled that a woman was running for president uh, that she actually created uh, made a hat for Margaret and, and sent it to her as a gift uh, to use as the hat to throw into a ring. Uh, so I think that's very fascinating. Um, I will point out uh, as we go through with the political cartoons, political cartoons are very fascinating, especially with Margaret, because we, and we have a book with over, I th I th uh, that you can get that have a lot of the political cartoons in it, but she was in over 400 different political cartoons throughout her career. And one of the reasons is because for a very long time, she was one of the, she was the only female in the Congress. And so cartoonists liked to draw her because she was different than uh, drawing the same men in suits all the time. Uh, but it is very interesting to see how uh, the female side of her is portrayed in these cartoons. And well, I'll get to those in a few minutes here. But there are also reactions from celebrities and in uh, letters to editors as well. Uh, right after she makes this announcement that she's going to run and as the presidential campaign is going on. Uh, if you look to the left there, you'll see that is uh, a letter to the editor and it's from a woman named Betty Grimes. So a, a woman is, is writing about Margaret's presidential run. And she says, how anyone can nominate a woman for president or a woman waiting to be or wanting to be president is beyond me. Can't you just imagine a woman being faced with a crisis such as President Kennedy had? Of course, she's referring to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, just two years, uh, just under two years before this. Um, the office of the president or vice president is no place for a woman. Uh, and coincidentally, uh, we now there is a biography out there about Margaret, uh, and is is pretty much considered the authorized biography uh, called "No Place for a Woman," and that's where that came from. Uh, but you have a woman writing in saying that there is no way that a woman can handle the duties of the presidency. And of course, in the center there, you'll see there's Bob Hope, comedian Bob Hope, uh, and his ideas uh, in, of Margaret running for presidency. Of course, he focused more on some of the gender roles. Uh, and he said he didn't know what to think about her candidacy. He couldn't see Betty Crocker as the Secretary of Defense. 
that was the best joke that he could come up with uh, was uh, that. So, um, and then, but there you also have uh, actress Betty Davis who came out uh, in support of Margaret Chase Smith. And she noted that, uh, Betty Davis noted that she herself was a Democrat, but thought that Margaret Chase Smith would actually make the best Republican candidate. And it was because of her record. Now, of course, Margaret was running on her record and Betty Davis was pointing out that her record was a pretty good record and that Republicans should actually pay attention to that. And she also applauded Margaret doing this because it would also influence other women to run for office and inspire others to do that as well, uh, inspire others um, to kind of break some barriers. And so you can see there's a mixed reaction throughout the, the media as well uh, uh, and from celebrities. But one of the more interesting things that is in the presidential files that we have is this uh, letter that was created by third graders from Texas. Um, and honestly, you could do an entire lesson plan series on this probably uh, to talk about uh, um, different aspects of how people viewed gender and, and um, in politics at that time, especially young, young students. Um, and our collection specialists, when we have field trips go through, they always will be in our archive and our collection specialists, especially when we have um, grade schoolers there, will actually uh, go through this and read off some of what these uh, third graders wrote. The idea was is that a, a teacher had everybody in her class write uh, if they thought a woman could be, uh, should run for the presidency. And so of course the reactions are mixed in there. Uh, and uh, it, it's very interesting to see what they do. And, uh, and even like some of the, the, the drawings and the illustrations that they have, uh, like this one here, it says, shows a woman sitting at a desk saying, help me. Uh, of course, this is one saying that, no, I do not think a woman should be president. Uh, the work can be too hard for them. They are uh, used to uh, cooking and doing housework and would be so unusual and it sounds silly. Uh, and of course, it's very interesting to see what the students' reactions in present day are when she's reading these to grade school students because, of course, some of the, uh, some of the male students will be you know, joking around and kind of laughing at this, and um, they, they may be agreeing with it, but I think in some ways they're agreeing with it just to kind of get a rise out of their fellow students. Um, but then uh, you will see how upset and, um, and um, staunchly uh, angry some, some, uh, some of the female students and, and uh, female teachers will get about uh, some of the comments that are made. And it's very fascinating. Uh, and of course, we, there was positive ones as well. So um, one, um, one female student actually wrote uh, a very long paragraph in support of it. And uh, what's interesting at the end is like, um, it, without women, there would be no men is what she basically says, which I think is a very interesting uh, take on, 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 on the whole situation. Now, uh, what's very fascinating about this also is that um, <clears throat> years ago, we had a very well-known uh, historian named Rick Perlstein, who actually came to our library and did a bunch of research on uh, Barry Goldwater. And he actually wrote this book here, Before the Storm. Uh, and so he, in, in 2016, uh, remembered coming across this book. And uh, he actually um, decided that he was going to try and find the teacher and the students that wrote these. And surprisingly, the teacher and the students, he, he was able to find. Uh, the teacher was in her 90s at that time. Uh, and uh, he was able to get in touch with some of the, 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 the students as well. Excuse me, as well. And uh, it was very fascinating uh, to have a little discussion about it. And he actually wrote an article about it in the New York Times. And it's, really, it's a really cool article. I'm sure you can Google it. It's, it's, you can still find it out there. Um, but it's, you know, being from Texas during, uh, in 2016, of course, you have uh, uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton running for the presidency at that time. And you, uh, it's very interesting. Of course, Texas is, is, a, is a fairly red state. And so a lot of the people, uh, he would ask them, what's your stance on, on women in politics and running for office now? And of course, it's, I'm not voting, uh, a lot of them were saying, well, I'm not voting for her, I'm voting for Donald Trump, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not against uh, uh, women running for office, uh, I, or I'm, I definitely don't think the way I thought when I was in third grade, things like that. Uh, but it was a very fascinating article and it's a very interesting look uh, to see what third graders are thinking about 
in 1964. Now, I mentioned cartoons uh, before, and so we're going to go through a little bit of them. Uh, but this is actually one of my favorite cartoons to actually show to students. <clears throat> and again, because I am a pop culture nerd, uh, I, I like to talk about this one a lot. And th that's because, of course, when I'm talking to students, taking them through the museum, and I show them this, this cartoon here, I always uh, will ask them, uh, who is being, who are they supposed to be, be portraying here? And thankfully, uh, we at least have a few students that will raise their hands and say that that is the Beatles. So we do know that they still know that that's the Beatles. Now, of course, um, <clears throat> the, the Beatles, uh, the politicians that are being represented here that look like Beatles are um, to the left there, Richard Nixon, and then you have Barry Goldwater and, Rock, and uh, Nelson Rockefeller, and of course, Margaret back there. Now, I don't know which one's supposed to be Ringo. Uh, they all have guitars, but uh, we always uh, go through this cartoon and kind of dissect what exactly this is supposed to be. Now, of course, those are the Republican, some of the Republican candidates for the, for the nomination for the Republican Party in 1964. And you can see uh, an elephant there on the left. And so we talk about uh, the elephant being um, <clears throat> the symbol for the Republican Party and then New Hampshire. So, of course, New Hampshire is supposed to be the, uh, is one of the first uh, primaries that is held in the country and they of course are all vying for the Republican nomination and for the Republican votes there in New Hampshire and that's what that is all about. Now this uh, was published in the newspaper in February 18th 1964. Uh, what I always like to talk to the students about is that the Beatles were introduced to the, to, uh, the American public on February 9th 1964. Uh, on a very popular television show called The Ed Sullivan Show. And surprisingly, a lot of students still know what The Ed Sullivan Show is. Uh, but of course, I always then do explain to the students that uh, do not know about The Ed Sullivan Show that it was a very popular variety show that played on Sunday nights, had musicians and comedians and actors and actresses come on. Uh, and uh, a, a, a large portion of the, of the American public would tune in. So on February 9th, 1964, was the first time that the American public saw the Beatles on TV and heard their music, and they actually played three songs, I believe. And this uh, cartoon is actually titled, I Want to Hold Your Hand. So, uh, and uh, it's usually at the top, it actually says that, uh, I want to hold your hand. Uh, and so I tell them, this cartoon came out nine days after the Beatles first premiered to the public. In America and as you can see nowhere on the cartoon does it say the Beatles uh, but you can tell just after nine days the impact that the Beatles have already made on popular culture because they are being used in a political cartoon and you do not have to discern who they are by writing out the Beatles you just had to put the title of the name of the song that they played on the Ed Sullivan show, which I think is a very fascinating thing to see the impact that the Beatles had already made on the American public. So that's, that's another one of my favorite uh, primary sources to use. Again, these are some of the other uh, examples of some of the cartoons during the presidential run. And you can see uh, how uh, gender kind of played into that. Uh, to the right, you have uh, everybody kind of running with their running shoes, but they have high heels for, for representing Margaret there. Um, even though all the other, all the men have uh, spiked track shoes there. Um, interestingly enough, a woman for president uh, candidate there in the center, uh, you have a rolling pin as the shape of the rocket ship that's going up, uh, which is very interesting since just if, um, at that time, Margaret is on the Space and Aeronautics Sciences Committee. So uh, I don't know if she ever did actually advocate for the rocket to actually look like a rolling pin, but uh, there it is. Uh, they're, they're showing that as well. Uh, and then the other interesting one down here at the bottom is actually uh, uh, one with Barry Goldwater and Margaret Chase Smith. Now in Illinois, they were the only two candidates that were on the, uh, on the ballot there for the primary in Illinois. And Margaret came very close to actually defeating uh, Barry Goldwater in that primary. Uh, and so in response to that, this cartoon was created and it has a Barry saying, look, Margie, why can't you stay home and play with dolls? So again, there's another, another, uh, gender role being portrayed there. And then here we have in these cartoons, uh, Tomorrow's Winning Recipe, and we have her uh, with uh, blueberry muffins going to the, to the New Hampshire primary. And the reason the blueberry muffins are being shown there in that cartoon is that she actually did give out a, a blueberry muffin recipe during that 
that uh, primary campaign in New Hampshire, uh, and it was actually published in the newspapers. Uh, someone had asked for it, and she gave it. Uh, and so in response, actually, you can see that, uh, where it says how to make fudge that's really rich. Uh, in response to that, Nelson Rockefeller put out uh, a recipe for uh, fudge that he really liked as well. Uh, and what's interesting, uh, just as you step aside from the, the campaign itself, the, uh, it's very interesting to see the uh, number of times that Margaret would actually receive correspondence as you go through anything in the archive that we have, receive correspondence asking for um, recipes. And she would always give the, uh, send recipes back out to people on congressional letterhead. So it was usually stuff that's connected to Maine though. So it was like brown bread, chowder, baked beans, things like that. But yeah, she would always get requests for recipes. And by all accounts, I was told she was a very good cook. And uh, we do have some actual projects going on right now, going through her recipe collections. Uh, uh, and there's uh, uh, students working on that at University of Maine currently. But then again, you can also see in, in the cartoon on the right as well, she has a muffin pan as the other conservatives, or as the conservative and the liberal Republicans are sitting there uh, waiting for the, on the New Hampshire Express there. Um, so, of course, she ran in those three primaries. We finally get to the National Convention. National Convention took place at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. It took place on July 13th to the 17th. Uh, and at that time, Senator Smith became the first woman to be placed in nomination by a major political party. And that happened on July 15th. As you can see uh, there in the picture is the Cow Palace. And you can see that she did have some supporters out there on the floor uh, of the convention uh, holding signs for Margaret Chase Smith. Now, the person who uh, placed her in nomination uh, was her very good friend from Vermont, uh, Senator George Aiken, who gave a very good, uh, a very positive speech about Margaret and, um, and why she should be the Republican nominee. Uh, and then we also had seconding speeches from uh, Maine Governor John Reed, who was the governor at that time. Uh, Ohio Congresswoman Frances P. Bolton, uh, Bolton, who is actually the first woman to be elected to Congress from Ohio. And then we had two other, we had a delegate from uh, North Dakota and a delegate from Washington that also spoke on, the, on her behalf. And so she was then placed in the nomination uh, and they had, and after all the nominations were uh, put out then, uh, they had the first roll call. And on the first roll call, Senator Barry Goldwater actually did win the nomination. Uh, he received 883 delegates at that time and Senator Smith received 27 delegates. Uh, during that first roll call. And I listed all the states that actually uh, were part of the 27 delegates there. So Vermont, Massachusetts, Ohio, North Dakota, Washington, Alaska, Maine. So you can see that it spread, uh, there's, uh, there's delegates across the country that were actually in support of Margaret being the nominee. So it wasn't just uh, the delegates from Maine that were, that were in support of her. Uh, now, even though Barry Goldwater wanted to um, uh, even though Barry, I'm sorry, even though Barry Goldwater actually won the nomination on the first roll call, uh, he wanted to show that there was uh, unity within the party because it was a very contentious uh, primary race. There were quite a few people running for that year, and he wanted to show that there was unity and get everybody in to show that everybody was behind him uh, to be the next president of the United States. And so he had asked that they do a second roll call. And so, and at that time, he had also asked that all the other candidates release their delegates to uh, then vote for him in the second roll call to show the unity of the party. And Margaret refused to do that. Uh, she refused to release her delegates. And so in the first roll call vote with her 27 delegates, she came in fifth place. Now, during that second roll call vote, um, everybody else released their delegates, but she did not. And so she became, she went, came, in second place to Barry Goldwater in the second roll call. Uh, and she always would say that from that point forward, that if anybody was asking her or talking to her about her running for the presidency, she, she would always say that she came in second to Barry Goldwater at the National Convention, Republican National Convention. And I think that was a way of her to show that this is the bar that she had set. And this was the measure now. And she was uh, calling out for the, uh, the next female leader or the next woman to see if she could surpass what she had been able to, to do 
in that presidential run. Now, uh, eventually, uh, once the, the general election began, uh, Barry Goldwater uh, was trounced by uh, President Lyndon Johnson. Um, Johnson received 486 electoral votes in the general election and Goldwater received 52. Um, sorry, I accidentally hit that there. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> she wanted to use uh, this as an example and to set the bar. And, you know, as we all know, it wasn't until 52 years later that someone finally surpassed that. Uh, but she did want to remain um, uh, uh, an influence and use that as an influence. So uh, one of the people she did influence, of course, uh, was a young lady from Chicago while she was running for the presidency in 1964. Um, and this uh, young lady was actually working on the Goldwater campaign. He, she and her family were actually working on the Goldwater campaign. And she, uh, when she was uh, campaigning for Goldwater in Illinois, she actually did realize that there was a woman that was on the ballot in the Republican primary. And that really intrigued her and actually influenced her. And this person from Chicago uh, go, went by the name of Hillary Rodham. So I think you know where I'm going with this. But 52 years later, that same woman uh, would then surpass Margaret uh, and, and uh, be, win the, the presidential nomination for the Democratic Party in 2016. Uh, interestingly, in two th in, uh, while Hillary was actually the first lady, I believe it was in 1993, you can see the little letter down there that uh, she sent Margaret. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> she uh, reached out to Margaret personally, uh, telling her that she had just heard an interview uh, uh, with her on the radio and was uh, thrilled to hear her and was excited that uh, she was still um, um, out there in the public uh, voice. And she uh, wanted to tell her that, uh, and I quote, uh, that she was an example for me as I was growing up and she wanted to thank her for her leadership uh, when, while she was uh, serving as first lady in the, in the White House. And so, um, that's where I usually end it uh, with, uh, with my students when I talk about um, the um, presidential run of Margaret Chase Smith in 1964. Um, so I will end out of there. And at this time, if anybody has any questions or comments or anything, I'm more than happy to try to answer them at least. Any questions for John? John, I do know early on there wasn't necessarily a question, um, mm -hmm. but now I where'd it go? Oh, there it is. I just got asked about would love to, or said would love love all caps to I use the Home Journal article next year in AP <laughs> Gov for media framing lesson. Is that something that's available? Um, a link somewhere to get that to her or get that to the group. Um, I can, well, I actually have Jessica's uh, contact information. I can definitely get that to her, but if there are other people that are interested, um, uh, definitely I can set that up on our website somewhere, or I can get that to you, Joe, if you would like. Okay. Either way, that is definitely something that I can, I can do. We, we have that digitized already. So are there any other questions? Jessica's mic does not work. Um, her question is, are the lessons you're creating at the library for elementary school students or will there be high school lessons? Uh, we are hoping to do to provide both. And so uh, I will be working on middle school and high school age material. And our, my colleague there at the library, Kim Nelson, will be uh, working on grade school uh, material. So, and like I said, uh, please check in with us at our library's webpage uh, throughout the summer because we'll be adding stuff um, throughout the coming months for that. Any other questions? I was just that thorough. Oh. Last call on any questions for John? Oh, uh, I see my boss just put up a chat too. He said, check Facebook. Yes. Uh, not only check Facebook, but we also are on Instagram and Twitter as well. So um, we are all putting up content up there as well. Well, at this time, John, I will give you uh, the formal thank you on behalf of uh, myself and all of the participants for being willing to share an hour of your knowledge and expertise, not only of Margaret Chase Smith, but all of your pop culture references <laughs> as well. 
<laughs> well, thank you. It's been fun and, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. So thanks for all, all for joining.